This is the second part in our series about money and the Christian church. You may want to go back one episode before you start this one, though this episode can stand on its own. The film starts out with a title card reading, Sure, Prosperity's Coming Back. It was released in 1932 as a newsreel. Newsreels were a bit of news that played before other movies. There's even some of that classic old-timey music. The image of an old man appears on the screen. He's in a garden. It's his birthday. He's wearing a flat-topped hat and matching suit. I'm not sure what color the suit is because color film was just about to be invented, but not yet. He walks with a hitch in his step, but no cane. A show of strength, he goes to a chair in front of an ornate wall. These are days when many are discouraged. He begins to speak. This is an actor saying his words. In the 93 years of my life, depressions have come and gone. Prosperity has always returned and will again. He's saying this during the fourth year of the Great Depression. The unemployment rate in the U.S. was at 23.6%, which means that if you were in a room with three other people, one of you probably didn't have a job. There had been many downturns in the market by this point. At 93, he'd seen lots of recessions. And now on this, my birthday... I desire to reaffirm my belief in the fundamental principles upon which this country was founded. Liberty, unselfish devotion to the common good, and belief in God. This guy was patriotic. As a nation looking proudly to our past, where it has been noble, and recognizing with humility our mistakes of extravagance, selfishness, and indifference, Let us, with faith in God, in ourselves, and in humanity, go forward courageously, resolve to play our part worthily in building a better world. Though the image is in black and white, the man himself was like all of us, complete with shades of gray. To some, he represents the classic American hero pulling himself up by the bootstraps. And to others, he's the very picture of what's wrong with America. In reality, he's probably a little bit of both. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Sterren, and this is Truth. The subject of this film reel was the wealthiest man in history, John D. Rockefeller Sr., According to Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, at the height of his wealth, Rockefeller was worth $318.3 billion in today's money. That is more than twice as much as Amazon's Jeff Bezos, the wealthiest man in the world today. Twice. You can support a lot of podcasts with that kind of money. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you've probably already reacted to the name John D. Rockefeller. We're in the middle of a multi-part series on money. It makes sense to start with John D. Rockefeller Sr. as we explore money, faith, and giving. John D. Rockefeller lived long enough to see dramatic changes in the world. He shared a birth year with a daguerreotype, the first commercially practical photography process. Horses were the main means of travel by then. But the world was about to get itself in a real hurry. In 1839, Mr. Rockefeller was born to a religious mother and a huckster father. His dad sold potions and swindled people across the fledgling United States while also keeping a secret family on the side. Not an auspicious beginning, but from an early age, John started to work. By the age of 12, he was raising turkeys for money. He was tight with his money in ways that never changed. At the age of 90, he was still talking about how, as a young man, he spent $2.50 on a pair of fur gloves. No, I can't say to this day what caused me to waste that $2.50 on regular gloves. At the age of 16, he hit the streets of Cleveland, Ohio, looking for a job. He'd been equipped by 10 weeks of business education and was determined to find work. 
good work. I did not go to any small establishments. I did not guess what it would be, but I was after something big. Six days a week for six weeks, he hit the streets and sometimes went back to the same establishment three times asking for a position. Finally hired as a bookkeeper for local merchants, at the same time he became established at the Erie Street Baptist Mission Church, where he regularly volunteered to sweep the floors, stoke the fires, and even led Bible studies. John was the superintendent of Sunday school for 33 years. And you thought it was hard to get somebody to volunteer for one week. 33 years! Just before the age of 20, he was in business for himself with a partner named Maurice Clark. They were commission merchants for foodstuffs. As the Civil War struck, their business was booming. Mr. Rockefeller paid to have someone else take his place in the Civil War and continued to sell in the expanding economy. Then, something happened. On August 27, 1850, Edwin Drake struck oil near Titusville, Pennsylvania. Oil refineries began popping up all over Cleveland, New York, and Pennsylvania. Soon, Rockefeller was investing heavily in oil refining, always looking to make the business more efficient and profitable. To control prices and quality, his company got into every aspect of the oil refining process. Oil was shipped in barrels, so his company made barrels. There was a lot of plumbing to be done, so they did that too rather than hire an outside company. By 1868, just six years after entering the oil business, he and his partners became the largest oil refining company in the world. Many other refineries were cropping up because it was relatively inexpensive to start. And when waste products were left over, they usually just dumped them into the rivers, which tended to catch on fire. And as much as Clevelanders love fire-roasted fish, John D. Rockefeller Sr. saw an opportunity. He took those byproducts that most refiners discarded and found ways to sell those too. Those byproducts became kerosene, lubricating oils, benzene, paraffin, petroleum, and gasoline. That's right, gasoline. There was a time when gasoline was just a byproduct of kerosene production. Psst, uh, hey, uh, why'd you put that gasoline in my car? Because you wouldn't have had a car in 1868. Oh, never mind. The real innovation was to control the transportation of oil. A partner in the business named Henry Flagler began obtaining big rebates from railroads, making it tougher for smaller refineries to compete. The Standard Oil Company was officially formed on January 10, 1870. There was a major issue in the market at the time. The prices were unstable. One day they were up, and the next they were down. Rockefeller focused his attention on smoothing out the price of oil. He did this by buying up other refineries, often paying generous amounts. This prompted some people to quickly get into the business in order to get a handsome payout from Standard Oil. They were offered either money or stock in Standard Oil. Those who took the money up front option were crushed to see the fortunes they missed out on as Standard Oil grew increasingly more valuable. He made some enemies who wished they'd taken the stock option. The larger the company became, the greater level of secrecy. Let's say that you have an oil refinery. We'll just make one up. It's called the Cincinnati Oil Company. Cincinnati Oil, your company, is Rockefeller's competition. So he wants to buy you out so that he can have the profits for himself. I'll take the stock option. Good move. Since your oil refinery is efficiently run, Rockefeller is going to let your existing managers operate it. Maybe make a few improvements, but the day-to-day might look very much the same. And he's going to keep calling it Cincinnati Oil. He's not going to change the name of your company. And this is where it gets sneaky. He doesn't want you to tell anyone that you're owned by Standard Oil. Okay. Uh, Why? because he doesn't want the government to know what he's doing. By secretly buying up businesses, he's creating a network of semi-independent refineries. You see, there were laws at the time that prohibited companies from owning other businesses across state lines. So the deals were hush-hush. If they called it Cincinnati Oil and kept it under the old management, maybe nobody would notice that Standard Oil 
was doing business across state lines. Ah, tricky. It was tricky. He was forming a cartel. Cartel is a fancy word for a group of people or businesses that comes together to control the market and its prices. Rockefeller wanted to do that with oil. We actually have an oil cartel today. It's called OPEC. The cartel wasn't the only way Rockefeller played the market. There was a fair bit of collusion as well, especially with the railroads. In 1877, other oil refineries paid $1.44 to ship a barrel of oil. Standard Oil paid just 80 cents. How could anyone else possibly compete? To make it even sweeter, Standard forced railroads to pay them 20 to 35 cents a barrel of oil that was shipped by a competing refinery. That's right. If a railroad dared to transport oil that wasn't standard oil, they had to pay Rockefeller for every barrel they shipped. And they couldn't cross Rockefeller because he was their biggest customer. He owned the majority of refineries. Without his oil coming in, the railroads stood to lose a lot of business. So Rockefeller's competition saw these shenanigans and got creative. If they couldn't use the railroads, they'd build pipelines. A pipeline. The Tidewater Oil Company was in a fierce battle to create a pipeline across northern Pennsylvania. To work around the monopoly, Rockefeller couldn't just sit back and let that happen. It was kind of like a game of block us. Well, first of all, it's Nick and I playing with our roommate Gannon. The idea here is basically world domination, okay? We've got a large square and a bunch of little Tetris-like pieces. They're all just a bunch of different sizes. So the idea is we have to start in one corner and then try to block everybody else from being able to expand if, from their size. And whoever has the most little blocks on the board wins. And the uh, the tough part of this is Chris has only lost once in the history of all time. So, <laughs> well, I, I explained my strategy to Nick now, so he knows what it is. And so I, I imagine this is going to be much harder than the other games. But we're, we'll, I'm game. I'm game. Yeah. We'll try. Okay, so, uh, so Gannon's going to go ahead and go first. Why don't you pick the first move? So Chris's tactic is to just to shoot across the board as fast as he can and cut off everybody else from being able to expand, which just traps the rest of us in the side, these side corners, and we can't go anywhere. And he does it very well every time, and I don't know how. With the added bonus of once I have gotten that island to myself, that perfect little island, I then start encroaching on the space that they can access. I don't think I've been this nervous on the show in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's kind of the first competitive thing we've done. I think so. This is when I really learned what you guys are like. <laughs> Chris, you were dirty. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a game where I you're know. supposed to play dirty. Know, it's a it world always, domination. It always feels bad when you do it, though. That's the thing. <laughs> that was really mean, Dan, and that was really mean. <laughs> was by some miracle. Chris has basically already won because he sectioned us off from a whole portion of the board. Hard to say. <laughs> the game is I know, it still hurts every time. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't see that. Oh. So the way this relates to John D. Rockefeller is that basically, like a block is board, you try to block off everybody else's pads and cut off their business so that you can be the only one that can play. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty much a done deal. It's like we're like, it's like now we're now now I'm working hard to just fill in my gaps. So Nick, are you gonna go? No, that's it. I think. So for those of you at home, Chris has a big smile on his face, <laughs> and he's trying to hold it in, but he crushed us hardcore here. Try. A third of the board is left unoccupied and controlled by Chris Stearns. Yeah. Truly the Rockefeller of the Blockus game. When the pipeline was running west to east, Rockefeller bought land going north-south to block it. That way, if the pipeline came to him asking permission to build on his land, he could say no. When it tried to cross a railroad, which was inevitably owned by one of his friends, he tried to pressure the railroads into not allowing Tidewater to access the lines. John D. went to local governments to stop Tidewater, but he lost. The pipeline was connected, though in the grand scheme, it didn't really make a big dent. 
In 1904, 80% of American towns were served by standard oil carts. They would take the oil straight to your home or business. Local distributors were strong-armed into selling only standard oil products. During this time of great expansion, John D. Rockefeller raised a family and frequently took breaks for an afternoon nap or to spend time in his garden. Contrary to the rather stern photographs that are easily found on the internet, he was known for being kind to his employees, often asking after their sick relatives. He played with his children with great energy while keeping them hidden from the world. One tutor was quoted saying, It was a gloomy horizon with a heaviness that pervaded the entire household. Silence and gloom everywhere. John's strict Baptist morals forbid him from taking in the theater or playing cards or smoking, and he was a leader in the temperance movement. There are plenty of examples of him giving money to all sorts of charities, from education for women to black churches. But he and his wife, Seti, did not like to flaunt their money, and especially hid it from their children. As a young boy, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was forced to wear his sister's hand-me-down dresses. The kids were encouraged to keep records of their money in little account books. When the four children asked for bicycles, said he only permitted one for all three in order to encourage them to share. On March 27, 1897, he stands up in front of a young men's Bible study class at the Avenue Baptist Church and holds up his very first ledger book from when he was just starting out. He called it Ledger A. It contains a list of all of his purchases, even down to a toothbrush. It also lists the 6% he gave away as a young man just starting out. I believe it is a religious duty to get all the money you can, fairly and honestly, to keep all you can, and to give away all you can. That's questionable theology. During his bid to take over oil production, later dubbed the Cleveland Massacre, he made an unlikely enemy in Ida Tarbell. Her father was one of the producers that was squeezed out of business by Standard Oil. She wrote articles for McClure's magazine in 1902, railing against Standard Oil, accusing them of underhanded business practices like collusion, bribery, and unfair business tactics all of which they were guilty of. Inspired by Tarbell's writing, the U.S. Supreme Court stepped in and broke up the Standard Oil monopoly in 1911 using the Sherman Antitrust Act. The behemoth was split into many parts, some of which we still have today, including companies like ExxonMobil, BP, Marathon, and Chevron. Obviously, Standard Oil is surviving just fine. After he retired, John D. Rockefeller Sr. continued to give away his vast fortune. He founded colleges and started the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission, which helped eradicate hookworm from the southern part of the United States. He also started various high schools and multiple other endeavors. This just about brings us back to the beginning of this podcast episode. In the garden with the old man, he enters without a cane and tells the nation, And now on this, my birthday, I desire to reaffirm my belief in the fundamental principles upon which this country was founded. Liberty, unselfish devotion to the common good, and belief in God. With the country in the midst of a terrible depression, the wealthiest man in the world, probably the wealthiest man in history, enters the garden on his own power as a show of strength and determination. He is given so much, and taken so much. He's paid bribes, strong-armed the competition, conspired to shout out his rivals, and, in the process, revolutionized the oil industry. Remember, Rockefeller was the head of Sunday school at his church. He even volunteered there as a janitor. He invoked the name of God during speeches. The same guy who did all those things knowingly broke the law. He squeezed out his competition and ruined the career of Ida Tarbell's father. We live in an era of uber-wealthy people, some of whom are Christians. We're not saying it's evil to be wealthy and a Christian. However, it does matter how we get our money. Are we doing it ethically? Are we working within the law? 
Do we respect our employees? Rockefeller Sr. clearly did what he could to crush anyone who got in his way. He used the power of his secret monopoly to earn an unfair advantage and squeeze out other refineries. What message does that send? People who don't believe in God read history books and they see this man was a Christian. Are they likely to follow Jesus or reject him? Rockefeller's story forces us to ask, what does it mean to be a business person and a Christian? Is it possible to be as ethical in our jobs as we are inside our churches on Sunday? Our legacy speaks louder than words, louder than the money we donate, louder than we can protest. We can stand in our gardens and promise hope in a dark time. But are we willing to admit that sometimes our actions stop seekers from finding our true hope. What do you think? Is it possible to run a successful business and behave in a godly way? Record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us at trucepodcast at yahoo.com. We may even use it on the show. This episode was written and produced by Nick Starin. Much of our information from this story came from Ron Chernow's book, Titan. Special thanks to everyone who loaned their voice to this episode. We know it's important that we earn our money ethically, but what about how we spend our money? We'll be discussing that in our next episode. We'll have links to the newsreel footage we talked about earlier on our website at trucepodcast.com. Once you're there, you can explore our archives, find our social media feeds, and donate money to this show. We're on Patreon and GoFundMe, and we also accept checks. Right now, I'm working hard to do this show full-time. I didn't plan to ask for money at the same time we're doing a series about money, but I need your help. Really. And if you can't give, please take some time to tell your friends about the show. It makes a huge difference. Thanks for listening. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce.